Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, workshop, Artist Survival with Maria Weyer. My name is Asla Knirsen, and I'm the Managing Director of VISP, which is an uh, arts organization for everyone who works professionally within uh, the visual arts of Norway. You can become a member if you are like uh, my fellow hosts, curator, uh, if you work in a gallery, if you're an artist, uh, if you're an art critic. And um, I think we're quite a unique organization, not just in Norway or in Northern Europe and in the rest of the world, because pretty much everything we offer is free from membership to, to all our workshops, classes and um, personal guidance or assistance. Um, just some practical issues. This webinar will be live streamed on YouTube also recorded. Um, I would like uh, if people attending could turn up on their cameras, that would be good. So we don't feel like we're just talking into a very small um, chat room here. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Yeah, if you want to ask questions, um, we're going to, I think we're going to have a break in about 45 minutes. And then uh, we can do some Quick Q and A's, and the same goes at the end of the uh, at the end of the entire workshop. Um, I will now give the mic to Christina Buta, who is the um, artistic director of um, of our collaborator Sector One Gallery in Bucharest. If you unmute, there you are. Hello, Christina. Hello, thank you, Aslak. And I'm so glad that uh, we're doing the third already workshop in this series. Um, so just to say a quick um, uh, introduction also of uh, Sector One Gallery. Uh, we are a contemporary art gallery located in uh, Bucharest in Romania. Um, we are focusing mainly on contemporary art, but we also do um, connective events and we try to um, help build the Romanian scene and do international collaborations uh, for this purpose. Uh, this project um, is a collaboration, as Aslak said, with VISP uh, that we started in 2021. It is part of um, EMA uh, grant um, funded through uh, yeah, Liechtenstein, Iceland and Norway. So the EEA grants um, are available for uh, developing countries, uh, such as in Romania was the case, uh, and probably there will still be other uh, grant sessions. Uh, we, we applied in 2021 uh, with a project that we are currently uh, developing until um, summer uh, of this year, which is focusing on um, contemporary art exhibitions in a series of nine titled On Master and Medium. Uh, following and in connection with uh, workshop, uh, lectures, artist talks uh, that also, among others, focus uh, broadly and also intensely on a cultural entrepreneurship. Um, so um, I will um, also um, not say too, too much um, about because I'm I'm really excited and I want to uh, introduce our guest uh, who will be the lecturer uh, for today, uh, Maria Feye. Uh, Maria is an art historian and a critic and a curator and also a uh, cultural and art publisher. Uh, she's um, um, has a broad experience in the cultural field, working in Norway but also in Berlin. Um, and currently, uh, she's also um, a teacher. Um, she's also the founder uh, she, um, of, a, of a gallery that uh, functioned, and please correct me, Maria, if uh, <laughs> I messed something up, but um, I think it was founded in 2008, and um, it, it functioned for a couple of years, uh, developing a program in Oslo, um, currently, um, Maria is uh, teaching um, and also uh, publishing at the Museum Forlaget, uh, Nidaros, um, oh, no, Museum Forlaget, sorry, <laughs> um, still learning my way through Norwegian. Um, 
specializing on academic publications within art history and museology and teaching the MFA students at the Toronto Academy of Fine Arts and also curating. Um, welcome Maria from both of us and uh, I think this will be a very interesting presentation in this series that focused on, focused on entrepreneurship in the arts and we are really looking forward to discover more with Maria about uh, how, how the perspective is from inside the field as someone who has experience in, in, in the arts, also from the position of a, of a gallerist and from the position of a teacher uh, and a curator. So um, I uh, leave the word to you, Maria, and um, we, will, we will continue yeah, with, the, uh, with the session followed by a break and um, we are here for, for questions afterwards. Thank you, Christina. Um, as you can see, I chose a, a lot of scary lighting today. It's very sunny, so it's not intended, but hopefully it would work um, still and make you even more eager to hear about artist survival. Uh, let's see if I'm able to share my screen. Does this look good to you? It does. Thank you. So um, we, um, I'm, I'm, I have to start by saying that I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to all of you and share some of my experiences. Um, of course, uh, the tools of how to survive as an artist is um, um, num. Um, you can go on for many more than two hours, but I've chosen to um, start with a few key factors. And you already had a presentation of me, thank you, by Christina. So um, I would just like to add that many of this, um, of what I'm highlighting is uh, uh, the background from being a gallerist and meeting countless artists. So even though I'm not um, running a gallery anymore from day to day, um, this was still my founding um, experience uh, as I started when just when I finished um, studying as an art historian. Um, and in the text where we present this workshop, I've uh, focused on specifically the Norwegian bubble. I often talk about Norway as a bubble, as it's quite, um, it has some uh, um, great benefits, but also something that um, makes it different for from a quite a few other European and countries all around the world. As I repeated um, uh, in the text, uh, we still do not have that many private collectors in Norway. So. Um, a key um, aspect here for artists is to work towards different public uh, funds and sectors. Um, and I will talk about how to uh, not just approach these, but what they do care about the most. Um, and uh, this workshop will explore the following topics of how to define a project that attracts attention in Norway and how to approach uh, and present your project to both galleries, museums, art professionals and public funds. And of course, these um, advices are not just based on what works in Norway, but I've focused particularly on what you might find a bit weird uh, or different with um, the Norwegian scene. Um, and a few weeks ago, I was in dialogue with uh, this MFA students at the Art Academy in Trondheim. Um, Trondheim is the third largest city in Norway and the medieval center. Uh, so we also so have the Northwest Gothic Cathedral and so on. But anyhow, this is a very international uh, MFA program uh, taught in English. And um, 
I was stressing um, the need to uh, be able to deliver. And I will give you just a little short story, uh, taking um, myself back to when I was a student in art history and I was working at an, an exhibition in Norway that gather thousands of visitors, mainly see for the first time contemporary art called Høstestilling. And that's been running since Edvard Munch uh, made his debut. And I remember one of um, my colleagues, because we were working on mediating the exhibition, told me that he was, I was a student in art history at the university and he was a student at the Art Academy in Oslo. And back then he told me that it doesn't really matter what uh, the artists are making, but whether they can deliver. And I was just so um, shocked. So this is why I remember it so clearly because for me as an art historian focusing on the artwork itself that someone would say something uh, as uh, brutal and and kind of direct as this but um i have to say that um being able to push send or give something like dare to present something to um an audience whether it's not just your artwork, but the text about it is very, very important. And uh, um, so I've listed these three uh, almost uh, obvious or stupid advices, but of course to have success and survive as an artist depends on, I think all of us can agree about number A, what you can create, what you create, what is your artwork? And ideally, I would like that this was um, enough. Uh, but whether it's our digital world or whether it's how much art is connected to some political aim or whether uh, different networks, um, the B and the C is, of course, also important. So the number two, if you can deliver in time, um, again, might sound obvious, but a deliver in time can also be a question on whether uh, can you publish your website before you might find it to be as perfect as you want it to be. Often I would meet artists who would say that, yeah, I know my website isn't uh, updated, but I'm soon going to do it. Well, what um, for me to advocate artists and to write about them, whether there is in a review or books or doing projects, if I can't find um, key information online about your work, um, this is, um, how the website appear is actually less important than whether you have an updated CV or contact info so that I can get the information I need or others immediately. So I'm not saying that it's not important to have your website looks, but remember that uh, this of delivering in time is also sometimes being able to think that, okay, this is good enough. It's better to, uh, or to, if you're exhibiting somewhere and they are asking you for a text about the work or some quotes or whatever, someone is asking you for something and you haven't slept or you have, have limited time because there's always a lot of different priorities for most of us, I think, especially uh, in our business when some of us work several jobs to fund our primary job and so on. So I really do know these issues uh, after being many, many years as a freelancer, but being able to make a priority in what is the most important and what is less important is um, um, very important for your professional career. So whether um, a journalist or a curator or someone is asking you for something about your artwork, try to, they do not necessarily need like 
five or three pages or a perfect um, text, but um, rather give them something to work on because often people are happy with less than you think they demand, but they don't like to wait. So number B is, um, uh, it's not a fun thing to talk about, but, but still, um asking yourself about what your priorities are and and um making sure that not for an artwork but for everything that is around your practice that you sometimes can deliver even if you're not happy with it whether like even if you're not you do not find it perfect because the artwork should be the focus on being absolutely um perfect this is something you should work on and sharpen and sharpen but there are a lot of other things around your practice where you can um, try to be a bit more um how to say it not efficient but um i i'm i'm always <laughs> working on this working endlessly on task texts and putting myself in a lot of work so i know to be able to push send it's not always easy, but um, this is something um, uh, sometimes people underestimate how important to deliver information about your work to someone that is interested that to make that happen um, and uh, uh, rather push send for something that's more or less okay than wait until next week or one month when you think it is perfect because then maybe it's too late. Okay, so I'll um, go on to number C. As I said, that some can make success only on number A uh, and number B. Um, if you work with um, not so, um, uh, if you work with two dimensional works that are not so complicated technically or do not depend on the collaboration. Um, it might be easier to work on the individually, but this number C um, is actually, when I'm looking back, thinking about all my collaborations, this is a very important factor. And then I'm not talking about the last word network. I, I'm, this is something that can be a whole other workshop, but today I'm, I want to address um the social practice of working with others and uh, then i'm not saying that you have to kind of uh, give away your artistic integrity I'm, I'm really talking about how we together as colleagues in the field make every day a fun day together so that people know that okay even if this, even if we have a limited budget, because most of the time we might have that, or we have limited time with this person, I know will make it happen and we will make sure we have fun and take care of each other. These, uh, these things are maybe not so often talked about, but they are um, very important. And also knowing that someone will support you and be and kind of credit each other. Uh, so I'm trying, I was trying to explain this po point with saying the number C, whether you're nice to work with, um, whether that is that you're positive or you're serious or you're fun or you're loyal or inspiring or innovative, there's not one specific personality. It's rather about the mindset if someone feels that they are being uh, seen and that you're not just pushing your own work, but making sure that this, for example, if you take part in a group show, how you relate to the other artists in the group show and um, also thinking about the, the outcome of the whole exhibition and not just about where your own work is placed. Um, at least for me as a curator, I have to admit that when working with a huge group of students, um, I see that 
um, I have a tendency to contact those artists that also uh, had a focus on the exhibition as a whole to a higher degree than those who were only pushing themselves. Because um, as long as there's no solo show, but a group show, these factors are so important for making um, a really stunning experience and exhibition together. So I'm, um, on one hand, um, I will always be an advocate for sharpening the works and that the artworks and the experience itself is something that should uh, be felt as strongly as sometimes I said, someone is pushing me in this, uh, we have this um, term in Norwegian um, to be pushed in the stomach. And, and it's not about violence, but rather having a physical experience where you're just, you're really affected um, through your body and not just uh, your mind or theoretically. So uh, don't misunderstand me. The number A will always, always be the most important, but do not forget number B and number C. Yeah. Um, so, um, and I'm also adding this um, to, yeah, remember again, even if it's not a solo show, but a group show, that it's really a great, great opportunity to present um, text about your thoughts about your works or something for the curator or the museum or the gallery to work on so that more people might be curious to read more about your works or to come see the exhibition. That's always what we want. Um, and I, I guess when there are questions, um, I will be interrupted, but let's go to the uh, next. Um, because this is uh, what I was highlighting, um, how to define a project that attracts attention in Norway. Um, of course, I'm at the same time thinking about what attracts attention globally, but I wanted to explain a bit more about this Norwegian context. Um, in the beginning, Christina mentioned something about an EEA grant. And uh, the thing is, um, as you see here, there are two uh, maps, one of Europe where Norway is green together with Iceland and uh, Liechtenstein. Um, and this is because we are not members of the European Union, but it's an agreement of the European Economic Area uh, that makes us um, be, uh, well, I, I'm not going into a long presentation of this, but if you ever hear that Norway is not a member of the European Union, this is correct. We are um, a member of EUAS, we say in Norwegian, but EEA. And uh, this is what makes it, um, well, uh, it's key for a lot of um, artistic collaborations. And going back to our main focus today, uh, Norway, you see here that uh, there's different colors on this long stretch called Norway. Um, I'm now sitting in Trøndelag in the middle, this light blue. Uh, and Norway is a very um, long country if we just um, turned it uh, uh, upside down, I would uh, come enter Italy. Um, so from Oslo, the capital in the south, to the north, where we have a border to um, Russia and Sweden, uh, it's a very, very, very long drive. Uh, but um, the public funds are connected to these 11 different counties. So. Um, each county on this map has different colors. And then again, 
these counties are subdivided into 356 uh, municipalities. So um, many um, projects in Norway are um, made happen because they connect to um, different political aims on either state, county, or uh, municipality. Um, and uh, the funding is arranged so that not just artists living in the south, in Oslo, in the capital, would get funding. So sometimes a project that uh, wouldn't get funding if it was in Oslo might get funding in a county with few artists. Now, now I'm just being very harsh, but the point is that um, in contrast to, for example, Sweden, our neighbor country, um, in Norway, uh, it's very important that there should be high quality contemporary art all over the country, not just in the capitals. So um, this is something to maybe have, um, to be a little aware of, to understand how this country runs and why there are so many artistic initiatives far away from the, uh, the capital. Uh, I've just made, uh, as an editor, this book uh, about the art centers in Norway. I'll, I'll just add a little history for you, but um, back in the 70s, just before I was born, um, artists um, did a lot of very important actions so that um, to fight for salaries for artists and um, after, well, during the 70s and 80s, each um, county in Norway established um, an uh, artist center. And the main aim with these centers were to be a support for professional artists, both to get work or to see exhibitions. So in Norway, in addition to um, the private galleries where we have um, the main um, group of private galleries would be in Oslo and then some in um, Stavanger, the oil capital on the west, and then some in Bergen and Trondheim and also the artist run galleries, we do have this artist centers now often called um, art centers all over now Norway. So there are 15 of these. And many of these are also uh, uh, have a strong international focus. So this is something to remember because often the main focus would be on the um, national um, art council and uh, of course other big funders but do not forget uh, the 11 counties these different regions in Norway and where you have um, art centers so um, I can make sure that uh, you will have links with different um, uh, places to apply for funding but I can also share links about these uh, art centers if you want to do research because they were really established for artists. Now some of them are have moved towards a focus on developing exhibitions. Uh, yes, uh, good questions. I just want to add that uh, on visp.no we have an overview over places and spaces in Norway together with deadlines. There are some questions but we'll do them before the break, okay? Oh. Absolutely. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, um, just, um, uh, yeah, um, great to have those links so you can also know that these art centers would also um, know their region the best and whether there are artist residencies you can apply to and so on. So um, there are very, there are very few people working at each art centers. So so don't feel um, sad if it takes some time to get answers or so on, but they are 
um, very important for knowing each of the regions. Um, and as I said, uh, Norway is known for public funding of artistic research. And here we see each of the counties a little more in depth. So, of course, um, Oslo, the tiny red dot where the capital is, is um, the most known, uh, maybe especially now with the new huge national museum opened uh, last year and then straight before that the new Munch museum so of course the capital is a great place both to see art and still to work as an artist but um, we should highlight the yellow region called Vestland. Uh, Badigen where uh, Visp is uh, situated has been um, really instrumental and key for working um, with artists and uh, are most known for supporting artists in Norway. I, I have to admit from Trondheim, even if we're trying to, to compete. So, and maybe some of you have also heard about Lofoten International Art Festival in Nuland. The beautiful um, Lofoten is also hosting um, um, an international art festival where um, there is a strong international focus. So um, in Norway, going back to what you're actually supposed to do, um, in Norway, it is very important to clearly define the concept of any kind of project. So uh, to use an example, um, if you have a fantastic technique, whether it's um, drawing. Um, uh, to get funding in Norway, if you um, cannot tell me why you are drawing this will be challenging. So it's not uh, sometimes, um, as I listed in the presentation of the workshop, uh, some artists working more figuratively would um, criticize uh, the Arts Council that they do not support figurative arts or that, that they're against figurative arts. I've represented both artists working with traditional techniques, drawing techniques like Johannes Höje and um, other artists working uh, with installation. So for me, there's no um, uh, opposition between these. But what I'm mostly interested in and what is very strongly focused on in um, fundings for application is why you are doing something. So what you are making as an artist, your techniques or your choice of material is a medium to um, uh, highlight something, to discuss something. It doesn't need to be so clear what you are doing, but uh, that there is some concept or idea that pushes your work forward is very uh, appreciated. And I, 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 I have not written an article about this, so now I'm entering a bit of a um, not shady area, but trying to explain something people not so often talk about, but the, this might be connected to the lack of, uh, well, it, it's growing, but still the lack of private collectors because instead of artists being supported by uh, one person or a family or a company, they depend on an ombud surunda, as we say in Norwegian, they depend on competing with very many other artists about funds. And since Many of these funds, as I'm focusing especially on the public funds, are tax money. Um, politicians or, or the different boards need to con um, connect them to some sort of aim in that region. So this might also have influenced a very strong focus on why do you do what you do? Um, I'm strongly 
opposed to instrumentalizing art so that every kind of artwork has to um, accomplish some political aim. But um, when, um, but there might be a link here. Anyhow, uh, whether I, I apply for um, private funds from a bank, like a bank wants to do some great work, uh, or more often with public funds, they will all, always ask you about the aim with your project. What will it represent for those who experience it? And what is it about? So how to share something about this that you might not want to share will be um, a challenge to deal with. And I often tell artists, you do not have to share everything, but choosing what is okay to share about your work without feeling that you are diminishing it. So key questions here, um, what is the theme? This would often be something you're asked about or, uh, and, and they will not ask you what makes your project stand out from others, but this should be your focus when, when deciding how to present it and what to share. Um, so um, always searching for what is unique and not something general. And one just stupid example of this could be if an art, I was interviewing an artist and trying to grasp uh, what is kind of the engine, what is driving them forward. And the artist would say that I'm inspired by nature. And this might very well be true, but often then I think this is too general. So you need to be more specific. What exactly in nature is inspiring you? So this about being specific, uh, defining what is um, uh, what is your um, unique strength. Um, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it doesn't have to be spectacular, but something that is that feels like I can. Uh, relate to it that it's personal somehow it doesn't have to be personal either but just using a, an example of of um not having to be um rock science but uh, really um what do you think is is uh, whether why you chose to be an artist or whether why you're working with this material so uh, and another thing I was stressing here, uh, not stressing, but maybe giving us a hint is if you can use your own background, uh, whether you grew up in the countryside or in the city or between different cultures or different religions, um, in a Norwegian application, if you can relate your own background to here I wrote a particular area in Norway. It doesn't have to be the area in Norway, but if you can use your own background to uh, relate to what you're doing so that it gives it more kind of body, this would be, um, this is something uh, that um, people often feel um, interested or attracted to. And I know this, um, again, choosing what to share, but uh, what you write in an application doesn't have to be the same as what you wrote in a text like that was available online. Um, I think we're soon... Um, uh, I will... Uh, I think this is a great time to make questions because I will start the next um, session with um, some repetitions and explanations of what I've said so far. So um, if you have questions uh, listed, I like that would be great.
Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Maria. Just a couple of questions. Um, it's very specific, but I guess it's um, quite universal. How do you network when you live far away from, say, Oslo or Bucharest? You know, how do you do it when you're not close to the um, the major art scene? Any tips? Uh, uh, I'll uh, yeah. I'm. Uh, I can very much relate to this question since I moved from Berlin and to Trondheim. Uh, Trondheim is still a city, but a very, a very small one. So um, one thing I haven't addressed at all so far is of course the internet. And um, uh, to, um, when it comes to this question, um, I have to um, really um, repeat as most people would that to be, uh, active in social media and then not just sharing about your own practice but following what others are doing is totally something that makes it not so important where you are. Uh, a combination of, well, uh, the physical meetings will always be very important and these days the um, art scene is um, criticized and uh, totally um, I I do agree that it's a problematic with curators like me constantly traveling and flying from place to place and spending little time from place to place and the same as artists and not exactly adding to um, uh, well sustainability uh, yeah so 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 on one hand um, on one hand, I would address uh, the importance of going to others' openings, um, not necessarily all the time, but supporting artists in your own region, even if uh, it doesn't happen so often, or to establish maybe the most efficient way of uh, getting yourself positioned as an artist is to start an artist run space and to do it uh, in a rural area I and then present this online uh, would be a fantastic thing and then I'm not talking about the fancy white cube with perfect walls it could be um, a to toilet that's not being used or an old cupboard or the whole thing would be how you conceptually present uh, this space. So on one hand, I would make, um, I would uh, start a space on my own, even if it's like hundreds of kilometers from the capital to make people um, be aware of all the things that happen outside the capital. But on the other side, uh, you can take part in a lot of online meetings and most of all sharing. Um, if you live in the countryside, I would see how I can um, on social media, whether it's Instagram or some other platform, share images from your studio or your practice that shows not just your artworks, but how you work and the process of it and people you meet. And if you do this regularly, whether once a month or once a week, um, and use hashtags that, uh, well, I many of you would be experts of using Instagram and other, but I'll just, and for those of you who are not too keen, that if you use 10 hashtags that are not the most normal ones, but at least used, um, uh, 10,000 times or 1,000 times, you would easily build a group of followers that would be curious to follow what you do. Uh, and if you, in addition, uh, start following other artists and interact with them and give their projects attention, um, this is very, um, because it's, 
even if it's happening online, if you are honest with your comments and not just giving, of course, you can just push like, but if you're actually interacting with also the practice of others and writes a sentence about what you're thinking so that people really uh, start relating to your ideas and your practice. Uh, this can happen whether you live in uh, in Finnmark or in uh, on an island uh, with no uh, cars, as long as you um, share kind of, again, this about being um, I said unique, but it's also about being um, uh, in no, um, Norwegian, we would often talk about being sårbar or vulnerable, daring to expose something. And you can always decide what you want to expose, but if it feels honest and that you're not just mimicking someone else, people get interested. Yeah, so that was... but. In addition, if you once a year go and see um, key things and relate to others. So the physical meetings are still very important, but you can do a lot without living in a capital and just constantly going to openings. And as you said in the start, having an updated website is, of course, it's even more important if you're not close to the capital, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, and Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to also add that there are some funding you can apply for when it comes to travel, like scholarships and so on, but that may, not in every, um, not in every town, but there are possibilities. There's also counties where you can apply for this. Yeah, th thank you for mentioning Aslak, because uh, applying and going to artist residencies, again, the artist residencies do not um, they do not care about who you know. That is a good thing about uh, Norway. It's whether you're, uh, I've been on several of these boards myself, but the, what they care about is your practice and how you can maybe contribute to this small or bigger place where the artist residency is situated. So um, daring to share about your practice so that people feel like they um, understand what motivates you and what you're interested in is, is really something you shouldn't underestimate. You're, you yourself are your strongest uh, uh, toolbox. Yeah. Uh, There's just one more question. You mentioned a, a book about artist centers, the title. Yeah, uh, it's in Norwegian, but the Kunstcentrenes Vexelström for Norwegian followers. Um, it um, uh, relates to a lot of subjects, uh, not just about how to, uh, not just about artists' survival, but um, 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 whether it's, yeah, that's, that's a whole book of, of its own, but um, it's both the history of how the two first art centers were established in Bergen, Trondheim and Stavanger in 1976. And today there's um, art centers from Karasok in the north to uh, Kristiansand in the south. And um, a key question for this book is um, what importance has these artist run centers um, had and still have for a living artistic professional life with production and uh, exhibition opportunities. So it's, um, uh, if you're interested to know more about the unique art scene or no Norway, this book will address it uh, very directly. I think that's like you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, this, uh, the name of the book, can you just hold it up? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's not so easy to read, but Kunstcentrenes Vexelström. Excellent, thank you. And for please um, share your questions with Aslog because I would be very happy to um, 
focus more on the, your particular questions also in the second part. But um, um, if we were planning a break, this is a good time. What time should we say it's now in 10 minutes at 10 o'clock precisely? Perfect. Maybe some people will join then because they got the uh, timing wrong, but we'll see. It'll be interesting. Okay, see you guys in 10 minutes. Perfect.
we can wait like a few more seconds before we start. And Maria, this question in the Q and A, if you you can look at it now and decide whether you want to answer it before the second half, or if you want to do it at the end. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, um, Maria. Sorry. Um, uh, it's a great question. Uh, it's being addressed in this session, but please uh, repeat if I should be more specific in the end. Good. Yeah, the floor is yours. It's 10 o'clock. Thank you. Now uh, um, I decided uh, there were ways of making the light less brutal. Hopefully I look also less of a judge and um, uh, uh, more sympathetic, that at least is the aim. So, oh, um, um, uh, now, yes, um, going to uh, both the funding and the applications, and as you can see, I repeated some of the Bullet points we addressed in um, before the break, but I wanted for you to see them both at the same time. So, um, and these um, uh, advices are not, of course, just for uh, Norway, but I will give some Norwegian examples. Um, to pitch your project. Now I sound like coming from some sort of uh, I don't know, commercial space or whatever, but um, whether you are talking to someone who are inside the arts, outside of the arts, or sending someone an email or calling someone, uh, to be able to just use a few words to explain the unique parts of your project is... Um, I don't want to say key because it's not key. It's something you can practice on. Uh, and uh, here, uh, it would often be maybe better to work on this, to have it in writing first, to be able to say it um, when you meet someone. If you meet people, um, you do not necessarily have to go into a long presentation of what you're doing, even if that's super tempting. But if you can, um, don't be afraid to invite people to your having an exhibition, just use the title and the media uh, if they don't know your work from beforehand and where you're exhibiting. At least if I meet artists I've not necessarily worked with before, but know briefly or not so briefly, to have someone um, invite me in person and tell me what they're doing, I will expect them to tell me what they're doing. So don't be afraid to say that, hey, I'm having an exhibition next year or next month. And at the same time, uh, try to be short and uh, yeah, I'm working on some new works or it's a group show with lots of interesting artists and just say the title of the show and the where it's going to happen. Then maybe someone can come with follow-up questions. So uh, don't be afraid to um, share, not just share, but to market your own work, just work on the pitch so that you can say it without having like 10 minutes of someone's time. And um, a starting point here could be what is, the aim of the project. And sometimes, of course, we don't know the aim of something when we've just started. Maybe we just know that in the end. So um, another, uh, for I think the, the most efficient uh, help I could give anyone, and depending on what medium they're working on, uh, where they are in their career, 
is to explain your choice of materials and medium. Uh, I've experienced that artists are often, uh, maybe this is not such an interesting question for them necessarily, and maybe not for you either. But the great thing of explaining that, for example, why you're painting or why you're, for this work, you're working with video or uh, a performative practice or whether it's um, some specific typographic printing. Uh, what I experience when I ask artists, even if they're not so uh, necessarily into sharing information about that, is that their answer gives me some deeper understanding of their practice. And um, materials, um, it's something physical, tactile, so that everyone can understand. So it's also uh, not uh, to be curious about someone's material or choice of medium does not depend on knowing, um, having academic background or having understanding of this or that um, theory or it's a it's a very broad introduction that can still be super specific. So even if you might think that, oh, this is not, of course I do this, or that's not so important. Uh, if you try to answer this question, why you have chosen, and I'm not saying that uh, explaining your material and medium depends on having to always have the same material or medium. No, 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 just explaining the choice for this specific work could be a starting point, uh, will open up um, your um, associations and references to more people than just your colleagues and those who are in the same practice as you. Um, because at least as I uh, tried to explain, um, more often than not, the choices of materials can be linked to the topic and make more people understand what you're aiming to do and communicate. So uh, whether you do it as just a practice for yourself when you're working on your artist statement, or this could be something to share that doesn't feel too personal, uh, because a, a journalist or someone trying to write about your work or you trying to write about it needs something from you and not just, maybe you would dream about some other person writing eloquently, like beautiful text about your work, but often people also want to know your thoughts and um, sharing. I've experienced that both uh, um, young artists in the beginning of their career and more um, older and established artists uh, do not mind sharing why they chose this material or not. So that could be a way of um, being uh, open without like um, revealing everything if that's something you are not so keen to do. Uh, and as I said, many times before the great break. It's that it's important to define the concept uh, of any kind of art project, specifically in Norway, this when it relates to funding and um, application, whether uh, it's for an artist residency or for support of a project. Uh, if you have a summary um, always available, like a, um, it could be, um, you have a bio, often I talk about 500 characters, is a length uh, that's not so long, but it gives you a chance to talk a little about just key things, um, your educational background, or what your, what other part of your background or life that is important for your work. And um, I've discussed the matter of what you want to share also with uh, artists at the Academy. Some are not so keen to share when they are born or where they are born. 
because they find that this is not so important. But if you just think that, okay, for someone to put together a piece about you, if they do not have the information about your birth year or where you are born, um, then it seems like they didn't do their job. So I would advise you to share this. It's, um, I do not care about some, whether someone is born in 1990 or 1980 or 1950 really, but if I'm supposed to include your work in a future book about artists, I have to have this information. Uh, and also knowing when you're born and when will give me just a little insight into what um, political situation did you grow up in? Uh, um, so it's, I would, my advice would be um, to have birth year and birth country or city and country or, well, I, I didn't grow up in a city, but I would still maybe sometimes use the name of the village because it has influenced me that I grew up in the countryside. Even if I'm born in Oslo, has lived my most of my life in Oslo, growing up in a rural area still affected me very much and the way I think. So to have uh, always have a short, uh, bio available um, on your website and this would also be used then for application and then um, the artist statement this is of course a text that can continuously evolve um, I uh, when I'm teaching how to write an artist statement and um editing it i'm constantly pushing towards what the most subjective the the thing that's um specific about you and your practice and maybe this is something you need to uh start sketching on and then have others comment on whether or, uh, because what you want with your artist statement is to make people curious to see your works so it shouldn't sound like someone else's artist statement, but to have something about, for example, your choice of materials and medium uh, and, um, and uh, uh, some sentences about your current project. So it's not um, a bio, but uh, a short text, maybe also just thousand characters does not have to be more than half a page. If we say that a full um, page in Word uh, with size 12 and 12 and a half, um, well, uh, that's around 2,200 characters. And I think that's a bit too long, but half of it uh, between, yeah, around 1,000 characters would be a great length. Uh, or a bit shorter um, to um, uh, start by um, using one artwork or one current project and how this artwork um, uh, is uh, characteristic of your practice. And uh, then again, you can change it the next year. So th to write on the artist statement is something that can be a continuous thing, but that you know that you always have something that's ready to use in an um, application. And three other um, contents that are very key for um, applying for funds in Norway is first to have a summary. So it's to present what you want to do in sometimes as short as uh 500 or 700 characters so you will not be able to list uh everything may but just it's pushing you to just highlight the most important things uh and then in the opposition to the summary you have the project description this is always a headline um 
I, of course, sometimes it would be, it wouldn't say project description, but some, uh, in some form or other. And uh, sometimes in a digital application, because most applications in Norway, if not everyone, that there might still be some you can apply in paper, but they are um, digital and there would be a specific number of characters you can use. So it's important to sketch in uh, a Word document or some other uh, writing uh, software and then copy it into the digital so you don't lose everything. <laughs> That's, I think, happened to most of us. But anyhow, the project description is sometimes uh, 8,000 characters, so a whole essay, but you do not have to use all the space you have, but, but you would need to be, it's really, um, uh, the more detailed, um, the better. Sometimes, um, you will have new headlines about your aim and who you're trying to approach and how you will mediate it and so on. But in the project description, you need to say something about um, the um, artistic project and who you are working with. And both things are very important. And even if you do not know exactly how it will happen, um trying to describe how you plan uh it can or should happen is um anyhow um a way of getting to know how you might be able to do it so i would um, actually say that writing an application like this even if you don't get the funds will make you closer to make the project happen because you're forced to not just visualize, but put down in words how this is supposed to happen. And by this, I mean uh, the, um, from the beginning of the um, project, how you plan it, when you are arriving, where you are going to be, if you're not going to be in your home place, and where it will be exhibited and where you get the materials. So often you would add maybe three or four key um, um, actions or um, central um, moves in your project and, and describe this. So it's not just an, um, an explanation of the artwork itself, but also how it is going to be realized. Uh, please throw in questions about this because I think then I, I'm even better at explaining. So don't be afraid to ask more about what it needs. But I've experienced also that um, if you, as I mentioned in the beginning, this about not just what about the A, B, and C, what you are making, whether you can deliver, but with the C about collaborations. Uh, in Norway, a project is often more realistic if you have uh, collaborators. And this does not have to be other artists. It can be um, working with, um, if you want some, Mm, funding from a specific region in Norway, it's always uh, a strength if you've established a contact with someone living there or a um, company or a school um, or whoever that might have an interest in your project. And this can often be um, organizations that are in Norway, we have a lot of. Um, organization that's run on um, people's interest, not just in the sports, but different, um, how to say, uh, well, you, you just need to do research or, or call the art center to hear what kind of uh, 
uh, organizations might be relevant for your project. But like say, if you work with textiles, uh, I was once exhibiting a uh, huge work by a um, um, Japanese artist called uh, Aiko Tetsuka. Uh, this work is seven meter in diameter. So it's a, it, a lot of work to mount it. Um, and then we contacted the local um, organizations, uh, organization for um, how to translate this for, um, uh, it's within the arts and crafts movement, but focusing on uh, Norwegian national costumes or um, the textile tradition. Um, and these, these uh, they have a, uh, many such fields have a national organization, but with small smaller groups all over the country. So uh, obviously this, where uh, these women were very interested in, in embroideries. So they had a special interest in um, Aiko's work, even if they had no idea about contemporary art, but they um, uh, were happy to be invited. Maybe they would never have visited even the uh, gallery, um, which is a regional art museum, if they didn't know, uh, if we didn't invite them and they took part in the mounting. So to, be sh um, so to sum up, collaborators can also be someone that has knowledge that can help you mount your work, not just to uh, have uh, someone working without being paid, but to build a network of people who are interested uh, in your project. And then these things are so important for applications. And, and uh, uh, because everyone knows that, okay, if you're engaged with this group or this group, they will come to the opening and they will tell their people because as I didn't highlight, but with, um, the geography of Norway, you see with such a very long stretch where very many areas are not densely populated. Most of the people live in Oslo and in the, um, uh, this region around the capital. So how to make sure that people uh, uh, both know about the exhibition and dare to enter is, is important. So yeah, so this about collaborators does not have to be a famous artist or uh, a huge oil company. But in Norway, if you can get in touch with someone that has an interest in what you're doing, um, even if they are not professional, but they are involved in the local community, you are so much um, yeah, this, this is very important to build your project. Um, so then, then going back to the questions that I have already, well, not questions, but ways of uh, highlighting. Um, what is your theme? Again, um, try to... Uh, this not knowing you, your art practice makes it, of course, a bit challenging to give advices on this, but um, uh, you need to, to sum up in Norway, to have success as an artist is not about necessarily knowing the right people, because if you can't tell, the Arts Council or the different boards, why you are doing something and what your theme is, uh, you're not get going to get the funding. So, so that's really something I find so important that the focus is still on a, uh, on a competition between a lot of amazing artists where the project that attracts the most attention that people really want to see happen is uh, the project that most often will win this competition. 
So um, networking will always be important to get, uh, to get, make people aware of your project and, um, and to be invited. Um, you really have to focus on, on presenting something that truly stand out. Um, and then the next, how to present your project. Um, here I might share something that's, that might sound a little harsh, but I'm doing it because it's much better to hear it from me than to not hear it and wonder why didn't you get a reply or why was someone annoyed at you? Because uh, these days I have, um, when I'm not running a gallery and being worried of getting bankrupt or uh, losing the house on my parents because this or that, but I have a salary, it's, it's, um, I am very privileged, but I do remember and will uh, this, um, remember that you're approaching someone, if you're approaching a gallerist that might not earn, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying you should be sorry for gallerists, but it's not my aim. I'm just trying to uh, make you think in a way that can make you succeed more. But uh, from the perspective of, of a gallerist, if they decide to show your work, they might not earn money before your second solo show, maybe in three years time. So they would have to invest a lot of money before they earn the first euro. So this is, um, uh, so how to present your project and how to approach uh, someone that um, uh, of course some, uh, we tend to say that in the art field, whether at least I hear from from uh, the way um, it is run, whether in Britain or other countries where there are where wealth has been a part of the history to a strong, stronger degree than in Norway, there might be people in the art world that have a, a trust fund and do not have to worry about money. Um, uh, in Norway, we, on one hand, are wealthy, uh, according to every kind of statistic. But since we haven't been historically, it hasn't kind of entered the mindset. Um, before, like, it, just use an example of my family. I'm born in 1977. And my mother was born in 1950. She uh, lived her first years in a house without electricity and without water, even if this was a big farm. Uh, so uh, before Norway discovered the oil, um, which is now, well, more or less my age, um, before these uh, 40, 50 something years, um, we were not rich and in contrast to like Sweden and Denmark, we did not have nobility because so the Norwegians, even if some of many of them are wealthy, they do not necessarily think of themselves as wealthy. And this is important to remember because um, uh, and also for Norwegian art spaces, they are not uh, run by families that, that has had money for centuries. So there are a few uh, collectors are rather people who have um, the most wealthy people in Norway have made their fortune during the last maybe 30 years. Of course, there are many exceptions, but so how to present your art project. Do not think that the other person you're contacting is loaded with money, because even if it's a rich country, it's also very um, high costs for, for having this space. So most of the times you, um, 
contact someone running an art space in Norway, they ha will have a very limited budget. Budget. It doesn't mean you do not have to be sorry for them. That's not what I'm saying. But just um, do not assume that they have a monetary. Um, and here's a lot of text, but I will go slowly through it. Uh, part of this text is based on an interview with um, um, another gallerist, not me, but I could relate very much to what she replied. So I thought this was a great example uh, because this is about how to approach a gallery um, and what to avoid is an important subject that many artists do not really get schooled or during, on during their art education or training. My number one advice to artists looking for gallery of representation is to not walk into a gallery in an effort to talk uh, a gallery into considering their work, your work in person. Uh, this aggressive and often badly received approach is the biggest no-no in the book, it says in this article. And um, what I, what is important um, when you approach someone is to do your research. And this, of course, sounds obvious, but um, I've had very many artists contacting the gallery without having really looked at the website. So it's important to, uh, uh, to rather find the gallery that represents artists that you also relate to so that they might have a stronger uh, interest in, in what you do. So that's the first thing. But I know it's obvious, but I have to say it because um, uh, this is so, even if you do not necessarily understand the profile of the gallery, um, you should take some time to study the artists that are represented and to see if there are some of them you relate to so that you show in your email that you've done some research or just mention an exhibition that felt relevant to you and be honest. Because if you don't care, if you're not interested, then maybe this isn't your gallery either. So the first thing I do agree, do not, um, do not talk about this when you visit the gallery. B, please uh, do visit spaces to find out uh, what they're doing and so on but the best way to approach is either by email or actually the old-fashioned mail send something a physical thing and yes of course then you can't send to that money but um this is um you need really to make specific approaches to every space um so first i've previously also talked about this about the the pitch but here it's even more important than other places because um if you send an email that is maybe longer than 500 characters and tons of pictures uh even if the one that opens the email might be interested they'll think that, okay, I'll have to take this longer uh, later when I have more time. So I would advise you to, if you're not, uh, if you're using email, um, think really about uh, what you are communicating by each word. Use maybe just one or two pictures not something that should be downloaded, that doesn't have to work. And, and make a picture um, so that uh, the size of the email is less than one uh, megabyte, maybe maximum two, but, but don't send 60 pictures or 10 pictures. Like, because if a gallerist is interested, they will see it immediately by looking at uh, some, you just have to make a very good selection and discuss this with other artists or your family or whoever, because what I've experienced is that um, those images that attracts attention um, does not necessarily communicate just because you have um, 
an academic background in the arts or because you're trained at an art academy or because you're a philosopher or whoever. Just ask people who dare to be honest to you about which of these are you attracted to. So, so um, um, make take some time on deciding between if you have 10 or 20 uh, pictures that document your work. And then do not necessarily use the same for each gallery you're contacting. Do research on the gallery and, and use some of the uh, words to uh, show that you know who you're writing to. Um, yeah, so uh, going to this text, uh, do your research first. And by this, I'm not saying you have to spend days, but you should at least spend one hour going through the website to see what the gallery has been doing, which artists they represent so that you connect with it and know that, okay, this, this is a gallery that could be a great advocate for me because they would understand what I'm doing since I also relate to what they're doing. Um, and something that came up in the interview that you might uh, reflect on yourself, uh, because I'm not totally clear on this, but I thought it was interesting to add it, is this gallerist is saying that a gallery may have clear indications on their website about how to submit a request for representation, or if they are not currently accepting requests. And if so, you will do well to avoid the ones that are not open for that dialogue. Um, I think it's important to uh, do your research so that you know about this. But if this like gallery says that they're not open for that dialogue, you might still address to say, I know you're not taking applications, but I'm thinking this would be so splendid for your space because of this or, and actually have a, a strong um, explanations of why you think it connect. That is not just something you say to be nice to someone, but some something again specific and smart and well thought through that. And by smart, I'm saying something you actually believe and something you've researched and something that would reflect that you are seriously interested in the gallery and also take the time to do research on what they're doing. That's so important. I, I've often been thinking that, okay, here someone is was trying to, um, what's the word? Uh, um, what this, what sweet talk? Is that the term in English? It is. Would you say that, Christina? You mean trying to convince someone of something in a nice way, in a... Um, yeah, yeah, to sweet. Yeah, yeah, because what I'm starting. <laughs> because what I'm trying to say is that I can admit that if someone has done their research and is trying to compliment me on something that many people misses or something I don't know nerdy or something that matters to me, and someone, um, if if you if you do your research on your. A uh, sweet talk, it might work because it's honest. That's so, so don't underestimate complimenting someone if it's truthful and a bit, um, um, and something you would have to work a bit to uh, notice. So, so that's just, uh, but anyway, uh, in this interview, she says that only when there is no information as to if the gallery takes on new artists to represent, should you contact the gallery about your inquiry? I Well, she comes from maybe a bit more of a polite culture than we are in Norway. We would, in Norway, we also care about people being polite, but we would, um, uh, you can absolutely try on something if you're doing it by email, do not call. <laughs> I remember or or find the gallerist on Facebook and write them on Messenger. <laughs> Sometimes there were smoke out my ears and some of my friends would say, but Maria, this person is just trying to, they're just curious. And I'm like, 
you don't care about how I feel. Because if someone was just, this is a cultural um, uh, lost in translation kind of example, but you can imagine someone from a different country uh, relating to what is polite in their country, like asking, how do you do? This is, <laughs> this is something we might ask about in Norwegian, but we, um, uh, it, 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 in Norwegian, the genuine thing is uh, very important and to be down to earth. So sometimes when someone was trying to contact me as a gallerist on Messenger by writing, how do you do? And I'm like, you don't care how I'm doing. You just want to uh, promote your career. Of course they did. But I'm just saying, do not use social media that is more personal. Uh, be aware of which channel you're using. So actually sending something in the mail. I do agree with the... Um, Galleries here going a bit further. She says that only when there is no information as to if the gallery takes on new artists to represent, should you contact the gallery about your inquiry? I disagree a little. As I said, it's as long as you explain uh, why, being clear on why you are super keen on this gallery and not just saying, I love you or you do great. Be, come with, do your research and base your uh ex explanation on that research um and she says that okay so if there is a gallery that um, is open to inquiries or do not say something about whether you can make an inquiry she says the best way to contact them is through email or mail and i totally totally do agree never by phone call or a visit because that's just jumping into, you, you need to give someone time to actually uh, look at what you're writing because you do not want to, um, uh, if you visit someone or call them, you might, you might um, provoke a negative reaction, even if they might have, have an interest in what you're doing, just because of a reflex, not because someone wants to be unfriendly, but just as a reflex because they're trying to limit their work. So I do remember when getting emails from artists that were able to say something about the project in maybe the first sentence and one picture that made me want to see more. So that's, uh, so about the email, it's the pitch and the length and of course, um, uh, and this about attachments, limit your attachments and uh, think closely about what will attract attention from this gallery. So further on, this gallerist says that, and I'm, I'm agreeing when I do not say anything else, the direct mail, actually sending something physically, approach is a great way to get images of the work you do and you're resumed right in the hands and sight of gallery you have carefully selected to consider your work. So this is, uh, it sounds old fashioned, but um, um, I think this uh, shouldn't be underestimated. So emails are often dismissed or links are not clicked and therefore your images never get to the right eyes. That's definitely uh, something that is a risk. Um, and this is about doing your research. As she says, uh, when doing your research on galleries who accept representation, representation proposals, also make sure that the gallery is a good fit for your work. Uh, as she said, I'm often approached by representational artists or photographers when my genre is query, clearly not those mediums or styles. So this is about both not wasting your time as an artist and someone else's time uh, because um, if the gallery does not represent any at all like what you're doing, then, then this is not the right advocate for you either. Uh, are there some follow-up questions on this, uh, Aslak? Um, let me see. Um, can I just add something? Absolutely. Um, because this is something we spoke of um, 
something I sometimes do if I need to get in touch with someone I haven't spoken to before is if I want to call them is um, text them first. And I'm not talking about galleries but generally because uh, I get so many unknown um, calls and I don't I have to screen them and see who's calling me. It's like a, someone's trying to sell me something. It's not it's not job related. So I'm always kind of uh, so if I want to get in touch with like a curator or someone else I haven't spoken to before, I send them in um, text and say, do you have a minute? Can I call you in like an hour? That's way, one way of approaching it. And not necessarily with galleries though, but also um, um, this is something I'm really, uh, I think is important with your emails is to have a good signature, to have uh, a link to your website. Uh, also your phone number, because there have sometimes been artists I need to get in touch with, but uh, they're not listed on um, on like different uh, websites, their phone number, I need to get in touch with them straight away. And, and maybe there's an opportunity going missing there. I do remember uh, some curators from also coming to Bergen and they wanted to meet one specific artist, but I couldn't find him. I've got his email, but you know, people don't answer email like directly. That is a very, very good point. Um, more often than not, I do not find um, artists phone number on their uh, website. And of course I do understand this, but as Aslak said, um, it's so important to add your phone number when you're um, writing someone. So it's someone you actually want to get in touch with because this is say that, no, but I, I don't want to, they can email me. But, well, I do agree. Then you might lose a lot of opportunities because um, some great um, new openings have a time frame because maybe as you said a curator is visiting the same day and maybe you weren't able to but at least you could have talked to this person so you could have established contact even if you were not physically able to meet and i uh, this you also mentioned about um, an sms i i so um strongly can relate to this because as i said in the beginning uh, most people in the art world have uh, many um, different um, work situations and maybe they are working in an office uh, like I do these days where I work with two others so I cannot take calls between daytime uh, today is an exception but if you uh, so this about uh not having someone answering your calls might not most likely has nothing to do with you or what you wanted to tell them but because they are not able uh, to take your call because they're also as you trying to fund their artistic practice by doing something else and um, uh, but by sending an sms as you suggested as like sms is so much better than um, you can like you can use messenger to ask for someone's email that's sort of uh, that's something I do quite often if I do not find someone's email or other contact information I can find them on Facebook and just write them in text to say uh, what's your email so don't start addressing the matter because respecting that Messenger is often a private, well, of course, pol politicians I work with use Messenger uh, as um, work space, but it's something in between. So it's always better just to ask for the email or phone number and then change channel. But if you have someone's phone number, as Aslak said, send them a short text where you say your name and uh, and ask, uh, can I call, when is a good time to call you? Do you have two or three minutes? And then be aware, then plan whether you can talk to them the next day or later the same day. The chances are much higher that you will get a reply. So yeah. super key things here, uh, always have a signature in your email, as Aslak said, with both link to your webpage. It doesn't matter if it looks, horrible just 
have it there anyway to have more information to do research. We can, many of us care about your works and what um, basically what you do, but uh, whether the website is fancy or not is actually not the main thing. It's whether it gives the information we need. You can also have a link to like, um, if you have a um, Instagram account or something, that's something you can add, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But There's you... a couple of questions there, sorry. If, yeah. um, um, if you don't make, if you make artworks that probably nobody will buy, is there an idea to contact a gallery? Absolutely, it is. I was uh, I was opening a gallery with mostly things that could not be bought or something. Uh, contemporary art is upplevelses uh, economy. Um, in English, to say um, Norwegian, yeah, it, it's it's um, to exp to give uh, people a whole new experience and a, way, a new way of thinking. Um, so if the gallery has um, other contemporary artists who do something that is, um, it, well, basically you find it to be really great, uh, please do contact the gallery and the gallery is the one to decide whether they find it a risk they want to take because every gallery wants to have something that really stands out. At least the galleries I define as ambitious galleries with a international profile, then I'm not talking about um, shops for art that do not. So when I'm now saying galleries, I'm saying spaces that develop exhibitions and um, promote um, artists that do um, established views. Yes. So yeah. so so anyhow, don't be afraid of. Uh, well, just explain what you're doing because maybe the gallerist might also see ways of making money on what you're doing. It, it's uh, um, whether the gallerist is someone with strong passion for the arts or whether someone uh, that is doing it for an investment, this will come out through the website. But um, uh, don't excuse yourself, believe in, just show uh, how you're unique and uh, uh, how it, um, why you are really amazed by this gallery. Yeah, there's um, <clears throat> a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, how do you approach? Um, how do you approach curators? Um, let me, um, yeah, this was the, I, it's, there, there are several things in, in common. Um, I would not uh, call someone I didn't know, but if you, if you send an email and um, you can send someone a text mes message to say that I've sent you an, uh, I, I would be a little hesitant to send the SMS if you do not have a specific uh, question, like I'm uh, now in, uh, I see you're going to visit Trondheim, will you come by my studio or something, um, a, a specific request, but um, send an email where you again are being specific on why you are interested in the practice of this curator and uh, the link between your own work and the practice of the curator. Um, and again, uh, add uh, the email should be based on the artist's statement, be, but be even more direct. And um, I would not write longer than 500 characters and rather have linked to the website. Uh, so um, don't be afraid to contact someone, but 
make sure you have done some research beforehand. Uh, and you can also, uh, and maybe um, not all curators are uh, represented with a website. So the research might be slightly more tricky, but I guess you would know the curator because of an exhibition you've experienced or, well, somewhere you found the person's name, but the, um, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be a very complicated pitch, but uh, um, yeah, don't be afraid to contact someone, but do, do it by email. If you meet, if you see the person at an opening, I really don't mind either that people uh, that I have no idea who would be would come to me to, to introduce themselves and mention something, um, how they are, uh, what part of my work that made them interested and then uh, ask for, would you mind come to a studio visit? Just be, uh, again, uh, don't spend five minutes on the introduction if you can't see the other person responding, but don't be afraid to, to um, uh, invite people to um, a studio visit because it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I would, uh, of course, this is different from country to country, but in Norway, you can absolutely go straight forward to a person at an opening to say, oh, hi, I was so, like, again, if, the, if you really mean it, I was so intrigued by your work in this or that. And um, then you will have someone's attention because, okay, this person put lots of work into that. And if you found something that relates to your practice, this is where you can start a conversation, even if someone did not introduce them even if you do not have to wait for someone to introduce you that's my point it's the same as if no one knows about your practice then open an artist run space that doesn't have to be open all week but maybe just a weekend in someone's barn it's just um it's so important not to let your career wait on someone else to discover you and also can i say um the good old uh, business card is not um, it's not a bad idea. I heard about this, I think he was an artist. He had this business card with a hole in it. So he told people to put out their finger, then he would um, attach it and said, now you remember me, which is a um, pretty good, I mean, I remember this story, it's like 10 years old or something. But I think it's yeah, well, yeah, don't underestimate the sense of humor either and uh, and I do agree a business card is actually great because I um my ability to remember names is um I it's so I, I often need to have things written down or I'll take a photo just like to make notes so I, I do agree but then if you have a business card I remember once one artist listed so many different professions just be, um, again, choose your words uh, carefully or just have, um, the main thing, you just need uh, your name, your email, your um, website and, and, and your phone number. And of course, in so the social media that this will, one thing will connect the other and then have just uh, a picture of one of your works on the other side. It, it's um it still it still works absolutely uh i have two more questions uh, maybe you have to think about this a little bit um if there are any artists websites that you really like uh, maybe you maybe we can put that um i could post that on the um youtube thing later yeah, that, that would because I, I would like to um, give it some minutes, but I would be very, very happy to do so. Yeah, so so let's give that in an update. So, um, yeah. mm. 
and there's one that says if if the um if the gallery is, is kind of um saying that it it's open if it says on their website accepting new artists then it's it's basically a free for all and you can perhaps ignore this approach galleries text or how do you reckon sorry can you repeat it again yeah i mean if if the gallery has posted on on their website uh, looking for new talent open for new artists um do you reckon they're more approachable in a way um whether well at least they have to relate to the fact that this is what they're communicating mm. uh, but um how open someone would be uh of course always is depends on uh how exhausted how happy or how stressed um, this person is. And unfortunately, this is um, something uh, and uh, the economic situation of the gallery and all this. Uh, but if a gallery says that they're open to inquiries, then there is uh, no need not to send it. Because I, I think it's important here to the same way as you sending an application, even if it feels like you might might sending over your heart in an email or an envelope, um, thinking that even if you do not get the reply, just that you made an effort um, is uh, uh, increasing the chance of more people reading about your work, um, because. Uh, different spaces have different um, strategies about how to reply. Mm. Now I'm working in a company which I I respect so much of oh, many reasons, but first and foremost that all uh, the writers to, who contact um, Museums Blogger will get a reply. But all those art authors who do not fit the genre we were working in will not get a reply about why they were rejected. And this is not to be, that there will be um, an honest reply, but this is because um, as an artist or a writer or whoever person uh, creating something unique, those who reject you, you shouldn't give them um, too much attention because they had some reason to and even if they made a mistake it's their loss so the mindset you need to think about it's of course I, I've, I've in the beginning uh, as when I opened um, my gallery I thought the, the honest and truthful and right thing was to explain why I would reject a project and I quickly learned that this made people way more sad than um, kind of, uh, I don't, I understood that this was not helping because my rejection was rejection they had absolutely not asked for. And, and that's also very clear for me as a, when I work as a critic. One thing, if I have a task as a critic to write a review about this exhibition or this concert or this opera uh, i am publishing it in a newspaper and thinking deeply about um who i'm criticizing whether they are, they are professionals and how this well thinking very closely about how this judgment will kind of enter the public space but for all the times when I'm going to an exhibition or a concert or an opera, not in the role as a critic, and when I do not really like someone, something, <laughs> sorry, I was not about to say someone, when I really, I'm not amazed by this project, I'm always trying to run away because I don't think that uh, my judgment is not something, uh, will not, 
necessarily benefit anyone. So if someone do not reply to you, uh, whether it's a rejection or it got lost in the email or uh, no one had time to read it, this is this you will never know, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. So my point is, um, it's imp uh, on one hand, it's important for, for the gallery to find the right artists, but it's even more important for you to find the right gallery. So um, do not uh, be afraid to try with those galleries you really um, see how you can relate to the other artists they represent. For example, if a gallery primarily works with installation and performative projects and photography like I did, and you do um, artworks without any kind of text linked so ever, uh, or whether you do paintings and you really do not care that much about um, the concept, then there are other galleries who represent paintings you should approach. Mm. Um, so, so, um, um, but, but, um, uh, so yes, uh, to the initial question, if the gallery says they're open to inquiries, they should be open to inquiries, but have in mind that writing a short pitch and do your research is as important uh, as if they didn't write anything about it. You need to know why um, you are contacting this gallery and, and um, find some, um, some links that would um, uh, make uh, the galleries um, curious. Hmm. And also the question uh, I think was also if uh, the gallery has nothing on their website, is it oh. a good idea to, to just ask them, are you accepting? So not sending directly, but just to, to ask them the question first, are you accepting artists' portfolios? Exactly. I, I think this is, we're entering also a, a, a bit of a cultural field here in Norway. We do not have that many uh, professional galleries, but I would absolutely contact a gallery no matter what it said on the website. And uh, uh, if it said explicitly, we do not take um, projects, then I would explain why this should be an exception and still dare to do it but don't be sad if you get a rejection or of course you please feel sad don't under like let your feelings be present but uh, uh, try to think that okay this is their loss and to have that on different accounts um, because the same as for um, or oh, um, um, actors going to countless auditions it is a horrible trial experience but it's necessary to put yourself out there so but if they didn't say anything about it and it was to um a Norwegian space I wouldn't ask for it first do you accept that um uh can I contact you because then maybe you will have a reflex it's almost a bit about <laughs> I agree, uh, yeah. yeah. The same so, from my experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah because this is, uh, here, it's as much as what you think, Christina. The main thing is, what is your project? And if someone is interested in your project and you're able to present it in a few sentences so that someone doesn't have to read like a long email, like they will stop during the email, then, um, then there can be exceptions. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, uh, Christina, what is uh, Sector One's gallery's policy on this? So we actually uh, receive a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot. We do receive some artist portfolios every now and then, and uh, we do not have something stated that we are not taking or something like that, but we just uh, encourage 
um, an open dialogue about this. So if if we are receiving something, we're normally taking the time to look over it and then we reply with accordingly what is our program or would we be interested or not and in what way. So yeah, um, we are kind of supporting a dialogue about this and we are definitely accepting receiving this. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. What are you sorry thinking about uh, email versus post? When I was a museum director, I know that I gave um, paper inquiries more attention, and with a paper inquiry, you could add more pictures without it kind of taking someone's time. It doesn't have to be amazing paper or something, but just that yeah. it's something physical. I would uh, I would love to receive that too. I've never received that. We have never received something by me. I mean, we do receive things by mail from artists that we work with. So that's just like an update or um, receiving, yeah, a, a book, a artist book or um, portfolio, kind of an update to it. But it's someone, it's, it's never... Um, an introduction of someone who might. So everyone is sending things by email. I think it's. I would also encourage it. I think it's. Uh, it's personal and it's. It it gives it some more weight in that sense. Yeah, mm. I would encourage it definitely. So yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe I will. <laughs> maybe you will be drowned in material. No, but but it could just be a small letter. Does you do? From my point of view, it doesn't have to be a huge expensive format to send, uh, whether it's um, um, just one sheet of paper with your a letter and an artist statement and a bio, and then some 10 by 15 um, pictures that document your work. It, it, there's no need to send an artist book or, of course, yeah. that's up to each artist, but, the, but to, um stand out and um um yeah i, I think this uh, uh still still works maybe because it's so rare that someone will do it and also i really agree i think no matter mail or um email or traditional mail it's it's really important what you said regarding um that the, the person who's sending it really takes the time to make a connection to the space, to the gallery. Um, I mean, to th this also sending something physical, uh, the attention to detail can can show in a way this. So I think it contributes to that. I think it's it's important to to make a connection to say why why your work would fit, and it shows that yeah, you have thought about it previously. So that's it's really a considerate decision and besides that yeah uh, being bold i think it also helps to <laughs> to make a gesture to to really go for it yeah bold but polite within the right yes. format so uh, like uh, to sum up if you are considering to to draw, uh, send something physical to someone to a gallery you really would think would be a perfect fit for your work even if they say they don't take um if they say specifically that they don't take uh, on new inquiries if you do not ask for being represented but presenting a specific project might also be a smaller thing to ask about instead of sending your whole portfolio so by being short i meant have your portfolio available but for those at least the emails uh, to a gallery like that, just pitch your project and why it's a good fit for the gallery in a few, in like 500 characters with two works. And uh, of course you can also um, present um, that you know the space of the gallery and how you would relate to it. Like just show your research somehow and just best of luck. And, and anyhow, in Norway, now I'm talking more globally about galleries in Norway. As I said, there are very few galleries uh, that work this way. Uh, so we have many 
um, art spaces that are part public or artist run. So the same rules goes for all these spaces to contact them uh, the same way uh, why you want to exhibit your project. So if you do not get a reply from a Norwegian gallery, uh, remember that there are maybe just, yeah, whether you say 10 or 20, how you define those galleries that actually work with young uh, or not so known artists, because I, I'm not talking about those galleries who only work with superstars. They, they have just, they're in it for something else, because of course some galleries uh, represent artists who were who someone else's made uh, into a success. So that is, of course, just try, but uh, the chances of rejection, if you see that all the other names are really um, internationally known, then that, that's not a rejection, but I would absolutely try. It's, yeah. Um, do you have more slides? Because there's one more question or... No, no, I, I'm, um, I just had very a lot to say about these slides. So please shoot the questions. Um, yeah, it's uh, someone writes, I often find artist web pages to have the same extremely messy and unorganized aesthetic, even professional people. Is, there, is this an unconscious, is this an conscious decision? Do you have any thoughts and ideas about this? And I, other advices on digital presentation? Well, it, this is a bit um, subjective, but uh, personally, I am... Uh, a bit annoyed by um, even some institutions have super messy websites. Uh, and then I don't mean old fashioned or hard to navigate, but those who have obviously been made recently, but they're just like, it, it gives you a headache after a few minutes. Mm. I'm not too fond of them, but maybe I, as I often say, maybe I'm not the person they're trying to aim. So this is, of course, also a matter of taste. But um, I would, um, if it's very hard or impossible, if, if the website is built in a way where um, I do not understand how to find the email or the bio or the works, uh, because that's sometimes the case and then okay I, I might be old but then the design has the design of the website has been chosen as more important than actually presenting the work but then maybe the website in itself is a work so this is a choice of course each artist has to make but the, um, to think about uh, the same way as is a person able to enter the space? And then also think about, is a person able to enter this website? And will they have the patience to stay until they see your artwork? So, so um, I do admit that very, um, but, but I, I rarely see artists having messy websites, it must, might rather be an art academy well, or it could be maybe um more the idea that visual artists don't have really visual uh, websites it's more sort of text-based maybe that uh -huh. that could be i mean that's my um, that's more my um uh my impression very often not that it's too sort of flashy or messy in that sense but okay now, so the question is what I prefer or, or my opinion on any, any sort of um, suggestions on when it comes to digital approach, how it should be. But I, you already said this, this sort of having the main, the contact info, the bio, um, that sort of thing is should be um, um, one of the most visible things, I guess. I was... yeah, so, uh, first, to be able to um sometimes it's hard to find I, I i like to be able to see works from different periods because as a curator i'm not necessarily most interested in what you made last month maybe i'm looking for a work from 2011 or mm. uh, two years ago so on one hand um 
no matter what design you make, but how many times do I have to click to get to your works? And um, also, as we mentioned before, this having phone number or not having phone number, I don't know if you have a phone number, will you really have that many calls? Yeah, that, that, this is a, yeah. something so for anyway, everyone to, to consider, but, but uh, just look at how many times I have to click to find images of your work. And then the other thing is, um, I also, now there are a whole list, I know. I, I would also like to know both the title of your work, whether it's untitled or have, have a title, um, the materials used and when you made it. Also, also I, can, I can add, when you said this about um, adding your um, birth year, because this has hosted uh, portfolio presentations in Bergen, Stavanger, and Kristensson. We've invited um, uh, gallerists from Oslo, but also curators from abroad um, and curators from Oslo. And some artists have not stated their birth year. And, it's, and so for the, um, the professionals to read through this and, and see this big gap in, in, in their CV, their, their bio, they're like, why is this? And um, they don't have an answer for it. And then they might not be interested in, what, in, in um, approaching this artist, basically, because it's not, it's as if they're hiding something. More or less. Yeah, I, I would. Um, there's no. I would not judge an artist on whether they were not productive in ten years' time. Just. Um, no, it's, but it's, it's so. There's no reason to to kind of um, hide your your birth at all. No, uh, you you um, do list your birth year because this is a key to me to understand what generation you belong to, even if you, you yourself do not think of it this way, it's... Um, yeah, I was born in the 80s. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it's um, just added. It, it, it's to the point where you think it, it's a little... Um, uh, how to say it? Um, vain. Vanity. It, it's a bit... Sometimes I wonder it's about vanity or thinking that, but that's not important. Well, that's your view on it. For others, this actually might be um, important. So yes, I do agree. And, and also because for the rest of us, it might seem like we didn't do our work if we didn't add your birth year. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, the other thing was, if uh, you, it's, it's annoying if I cannot save pictures from your website. It doesn't, I, I'm, I'm not saying that I should be given access to high uh, quality files, but if it's something, some artists have websites where I cannot save images. And that means that I cannot uh, present some of their work in a proposal or it's just very annoying. So make sure it's possible to save uh, low quality so no one can actually make money on your work or steal your work or anything, but just to make uh, um, the whole, uh, yeah. So, so there were a few tips <laughs> about what to do. And, and I, I, I see, I, I just keep talking and talking. I, I know we should have, but um, this is a very interesting subject. Yeah. it's. Um... I think there's one more question, we just don't uh, answer this. Uh, do you have any thoughts on selling your work uh, as a professional but young artist directly from your website or social media accounts? Any experience with this? Oh, um, this is a um, good and important question. Um, I, I would absolutely not be afraid to promote uh, and um, sell my work and, and again do not have to wait for others to discover me but here comes a super important part if you establish prices that's lower than it would be in the gallery when you have percentage that's a big no-no to get 
represented or to be taken seriously. Never sell cheaper from your studio, even uh, uh, than a gallery. You might give a, many collectors would from a gallery expect maybe a 20% collector's discount because their collection will uh, add to the CV of the artists and things like this. But uh, make sure that you have a price that can also be high enough for a gallery to take 30, 40, or 50%. And uh, remember that prices are, um, if your career develops and a gallery is taking you in and starts taking you to art fairs and so on, this will have a very strong influence on your price because it's expensive actually to ex exhibit your artworks. Going to an art fair is extremely big a financial affair for a gallery, so it has to influence the prices. But uh, when you've established, like if a, one of your works costs 2000 euros, you cannot um, really go down again or sell it for 1500 from your studio. So this is, um, on one hand, an artwork is not worth more, than someone is able, someone is willing to pay for it. That's on the one hand a very brutal thing, but the more uh, people know about your work and if someone actually has bought your works, whether a private person, an established collector or a business or whoever, this will add to how your price develops. So you can slowly or quickly develop your price. For example, if you're working in, in additions, well, this is a whole workshop of its own about price setting, but I just wanted to highlight when, on one hand, don't be afraid to start selling your work from your website or your Instagram, but remember to that you cannot, as a professional artist or for, for someone who wants to be taken in as with a gallery, um, have two prices at the same time. What the price in the gallery has to be the same as everywhere else. If you start selling things from the studio, the gallery will find out and uh, uh, they will not necessarily want to continue working with you. Or they will, if they really love your work, they would tell you this has to stop. But most likely they would just not give you a new exhibition and they will, they will find out. So I, I'm, I'm asking you to consider making a price where you're willing to, where, where up to 50% can go to an, uh, um, a space if you want to have that as an aim, because it's very, it doesn't look good if your prices are higher when they're in an exhibition than from your studio. Okay, so, so that's, that's the do's and don'ts for me on that part, yeah. Thank you so much. I think we need to um, to um, call it a day. Um, I put it in the chat. There's a link to the YouTube. Um, so there's a live stream of, on YouTube that you can watch again if you like. Rewind for highlights. The particular sections you prefer to see again. Um, and we will also, we will also upload, upload it on our YouTube yeah, yeah. later. So and also um, we will have um, a link on um, on visp I know on the um, on the uh, um, events um, link to the YouTube um, YouTube uh, stream. Um, so um, and the website that I I, I will uh, say which ones. And again, that's my opinion. Um, yeah. But um, now you know a bit more about uh, why I prefer what I do. Yeah. Cool, thank you so much. Um, Christina, final words? Well, just thank you so much, Faria. And uh, I think it was, even though, um, of course, you've spoken from your perspective and from Norway and addressing examples from Norway, I think everything that you said is really general, generally um, working. So I could really um, find a lot of useful information uh, for 
creative people in, in your whole presentation. So thank you so much for that. Yes, thank you again, uh, Maria. Thank you, Christina. And to everyone who um, joined us here today, both on, on Zoom and on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you all. And um, uh, this is for the Norwegian um, artist on Monday, April 17th. We'll have a, we'll have a um, online um, workshop on how, how to work in, um, in boards. If you are elected to a board in Norway, it's, it's in Norwegian. FYI, that's eight o'clock. You can find more information on wisp.no. So thank you, one and all. Um, Best of luck, be adventurous. Yes, <laughs> be adventurous. Okay, thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.